I know that it's sunny outside, so thank you for coming back. Uh, the next up, our speaker has two decades long career and experience working in advertising industry and he worked as a creative director in one of the biggest advertising agency in the world. So his next, his moderator will be Vanya, so I would invite him to come to the stage. This year, like I said, several of our dreams came true. And I'm announcing our new speaker because also one of my personal dreams came true right now. Ever since for the first Spark Me, I was hoping that one day I will be able to host a nude model on this stage. And today I have the opportunity to really host a former nude model on this stage. Unfortunately, he didn't work for Victoria's Secret, but it's a good place to start, you know. When I formulated my dream, I didn't say it has to be like a really hot 5'9 chick. So I've got a guy from Scotland, but it's okay for a start. Uh, Dave, I've been creatively stalking him for like five months. And he told me, yes, I'm really interested and keen on go going to Montenegro and speaking there on stage. But there's like a one small little issue. My wife is pregnant and she's about to deliver the baby, so we need to wait for that. And I'm like, okay, man, cool. And then I was about, is it there yet? Is it there yet? Is it there yet? <laughs> so finally, everything was okay. The baby is here now. A big clap for the baby. <laughs> and one, once everything was perfect and done, Dave emailed me and said, man, I'm coming, book my flight. He'll be here for like 24 hours. I'm really sorry to miss him for the cruise and stuff. But he said, no, I gave my word and I'm coming. And he really is here today. So a huge round of applause for Dave Burst. I've done it now, you can hear me. Good morning. You've all had your coffee, you're feeling, a, feeling nice and perky, yes? Yes, good. Right. Does this work? What am I doing wrong? Oh, it's that one, isn't it? It's just the computer, I'll just use the computer. There we go. Ah, hello my beautiful people. I, I'm not even going to insult you by trying to pronounce that. <laughs> um, because, of course, everything I, everything I say, no matter what language I speak in, it has a Scottish accent. Um, so I will put this down, and I will, I will use this. So you can heckle me. This is where to heckle me, please. In fact, you can shout out and heckle me as well. I don't mind a bit of that. So how to think harder. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to give you 12 easy to swallow tablets, uh, little, little tips um, to keep you a raging ideas machine all night long, baby. Um, right, here we go. Is this going to work? Thank you very much. But you know, this time yesterday, I was merely, there we go, I was, I was merely the the host of a web series this time yesterday. But last night, my documentary series was broadcast on British television, national television. So today, I can officially say I'm a television presenter. And I've got to say I apologize because that doesn't mean that what I'm going to say is any better. Um, but we're going to try and race through. We've got not got a huge amount of time, so I'm going to try and race through some of these creative tips. But before we do that, I also want to say I'm the, I'm the editor at large for a publication here. Have any of you ever visited thedrum.com? Have any of you? A few of you? Few. Thedrum.com is, is Europe's largest 
um, marketing technology creative industry website. And you might spot these lying around. If you do, pick one up. They don't cost any money, all right? So let's get on with it. So companies very often invite me in to try and give them creative skills. They think that I can go in and I can teach them creative techniques. And these creative techniques will turn all of their staff into creative superhumans who are able to come up with much better ideas. And yes, I can. People often say to me, how, how do you make people more creative? And I say, I don't. I make people less uncreative. Because there's a difference. Because people learn how to not be creative. Everyone starts creative. As a kid, you're creative. And people learn how to not be creative by putting layers of fear why they don't do stuff. So that's one thing. I can help to break down those barriers to, to get people coming up with more ideas and, and giving them techniques to do that. But the problem is they're still working with what they've got in their head. These techniques are only able to manipulate the information they have in their head. The most important thing, if you want to be great at coming up with ideas, is to fill your mind with the good stuff. It's actually try and go out there and, and just find stuff that's interesting to fill your mind with. If you don't have interesting things in your head, you're not going to come up with interesting ideas. Which brings us to the next point. You need to get into a habit of the spotting the things that other people don't spot. Because if you do that, you're going to fill your mind with the information that other people don't have. And if you have that in your head, you're going to come up with the ideas that other people won't come up with. And that makes you really special if you're able to do that. So you have to get into a habit. A lot of people think that creativity, it's, it, it kind of like starts at the beginning of the brainstorm and then you switch it off at the end of the brainstorm. That's, that's a sure found way to be crap, all right? Because brainstorms are dreadful things. Brainstorms have been proven to give you fewer ideas and worse ideas than if you were to take the same amount of people and get them working independently for that same amount of time on the same problem. So brainstorms themselves actually lead to um, just average ideas and first thoughts. And that's not what great ideas are. Another thing we're hearing this morning, Prakaja was saying that uh, you, you've got to burst those filter bubbles. And he was talking about um, projection bias. How what we do is we take our own experiences and think that everyone else is like us. It's, it's like a form of um, egocentrism, that we think everybody's like us. And if they're not like us, they're not normal. I mean, first of all, there's a lie there. You think you're normal, <laughs> really. Um, so you should be seeking new experiences by, by putting yourself into new experiences. Um, oh, that's me, isn't it? I've just dropped my pass. Um, if you put yourself into new experiences, you learn things about yourself and you're able to understand other people. So for example, if I asked someone here what it feels like to land on the moon, maybe Timo would be able to sort of tell me sort of as, as the sort of most informed opinion. But if I was to ask any of you here what it'd be like to land on the moon, what it feels like, I'm sure you could tell me what you think it might feel like, but you wouldn't actually properly understand what it feels like to be an astronaut who uh, has done several years of training and everything's been leading up to this moment. You wouldn't understand what it feels like to have just been strapped to an explosive missile that a lot of people have died trying to make that same journey. You wouldn't understand the fear of that and then the relief to be up there and the fear to do a re-entry. You wouldn't understand that. So you need to experience as many things as you can so you can understand other people. If you understand other people, you'll be able to solve problems in a more informed and more intelligent way. Oh, excuse me. Another thing is people think that creativity in business. It is business, so you have to be business-like. That means you maybe start at nine in the morning, finish at five. Actually, creativity doesn't work like that. Creativity works best in short bursts, short periods of time. You can tire out your brain very easily. Have any of you ever had that experience where you're trying to come up with an idea, a solution for something, and you feel as if you're getting in a rut, and you do that thing, you go, think, 
Come on, think, ideas. That's the point where your brain is telling you to step back. Just step back from the problem and put your mind onto something else. Because it works best when you can move back from a problem and it gives you a new perspective on it. And when you move away from something, you're able to focus on it better and see how it fits in. So it's actually really important with creativity that you do things in short bursts and then take a break. And another thing that you might find is that it's good to be working on more than one problem at a time because you'll find that the ideas will cross-fertilize with each other. It's one of the things that I found in creative departments. Give people two or three jobs. They'll come up with better ideas than if you just have them concentrating on one. This is really important. There's a, a part of your brain just above your right ear that's called the anterior superior temporal gyrus. At this point, I'm sounding pretty intelligent. I know, uh, and I'm wearing glasses. I don't even need them. No, I do. Uh, so this, this part of your brain here, this has been discovered only in the last few years with brain science, to activate just a few seconds before you have a moment of inspiration, when you have a, a moment of insight. And that's when two things come together and connect. And that's very much what creative ideas are. There, there's no such thing as a new, fresh idea, but creative ideas are a recombination of existing elements. So it's ideas that are out there, and you combine them, and you create something new with them. And what they found is that this part of your brain that is responsible for these moments of insight, these connections, it only switches on when you're in alpha state. Alpha state is when you're relaxed. Um, how many of you here sort of find that you come up with your best ideas maybe in the morning? You know, when you wake up, you're relaxed, yeah? When, when you're on the toilet? Yeah, me too. Uh, when you're in, in a shower, in a bath, waiting for a bus. When you're actually in a moment where you're relaxed, that is very often when these moments come to you, these ideas come to you. And that is this part of your brain switching on. And th this is almost, it's, it's like taking the the work that's been done by your back brain that you've got no conscious uh, control over, and it's like firing it to the front brain. And that is what this part does here. So you need to chill out. You, you find if you want to judge stuff, get pissed off. <laughs> They've found that if you are irritated, if you're a little bit annoyed, or even just downright angry, you're better at judging things. So there's two parts to the idea process. You've got... Um, uh, you've got when you're creating lots of different ideas, you've got, you've got convergent and divergent thinking. So divergent thinking is when you're coming up with lots and lots of options. Don't put judgment, don't apply judgment to that. Convergent is when you are then applying judgment and getting it down to the one best option. So you've got divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And you, one, you need judgment, and the other, you must stop judging and just generate ideas. Do you know... The last uh, couple of advertising agencies that I worked for, I found places in the office that I could sleep. I built a television studio for a big ad agency, and as the creative director, I was one of the only people at the key to it. I've got to say that soundproof insulation foam is one of the most comfortable beds I have ever slept on. And I used to go down there and sleep, uh, mainly for two reasons. One, because I was sometimes hungover. Uh, and, and it's good to just be able to go and have a little bit of a sleep when you're hungover. And, and the other is that if you find yourself getting a bit tired and, and coming up with ideas can tire you out, it's really good for you to go and have a nap. Because when you wake up, you're in that relaxed state and ideas can come to you. When you go for a sleep, the ideas move from your front brain to your back brain, and your back brain is a lot more powerful. Come on, having a beer, that's good. Um, so this is, I did an experiment a few years ago, and it was to see if alcohol makes you more creative. I took 20 advertising creatives, and I gave them the same brief. Half of them were allowed to drink as much as they wanted for three hours, and the other half were only allowed to drink water. The ones who were told that they weren't allowed to drink alcohol stormed out, <laughs> and I had to encourage them to come back in and do the test. And we found that having alcohol actually made people produce more ideas and better ideas. We got the ideas judged by top creative directors. We got them judged by the public. And we discovered in, in all the judging sessions we did that about four out of five of the top ideas came from the team that had been drinking. 
And there's something that's beautiful that happens if you just have a couple of pints. Like there's this magic point in between the end of your first beer and falling over in the gutter and vomiting in someone's shoe. No, it's actually a little bit earlier than that. It's, it's in between like one and three. There is uh, a magic point where your inhibitions are brought down and it gives you freedom to come up with ideas that you wouldn't normally come up with. And, and you may find if you don't drink that actually caffeine can do this, you know, as well. So, um, or, or heroin. No, I'm not, no, I'm not, not going there. Um, another thing that you can do is, is, is go to an inspiring place. Offices are toxic. I hate offices. If you think of the way that a desk is set out, you've got a monitor in front of you, you've got a keyboard there, you've got the mouse there, you've got some funny little stickers that you picked off apples stuck around the monitor, you know, you've, uh, you've, you've got your pencils over there. So, so what people do, because the predominant thing on their desk is a computer, they think that the way in an office that you're expected to act to be productive is to hit those keys harder and faster. Now that's doing. That's a doing action. That's not a thinking action. Creativity is a thinking action. If you want people to actually come up with better ideas, get them away from their desks. Take them to some place that's inspiring. Go out to a coffee shop. Go out to a museum. Go to a record shop and browse through the sleeves. If you go to some place that's inspiring, you will come up with interesting ideas. You just can't do it at an office desk because office desks are shit. Yeah, go on, fuck you, the man. That's us. Right, the, the other thing that's a great thing to do is um, if you think that I can't solve this problem, because a lot of people will very often say that thing, no, I'm not creative. I'm not creative. You're, you're the creative. No, everyone is creative. Everyone has the ability to be creative. One of the first things you have to do is separate creativity into two things. There's creative execution and there's creative problem solving. I deal with creative problem solving. It just so happens that I'm a writer and a designer so I can do the execution, but I teach people how to solve problems. Creative problem solving, everyone should do that and everyone needs to get better at it. So one of the things you can do if you're getting this barrier of saying, I can't solve that, I can't do that, that's not me, is pretend you're somebody who could do that. You know, what, how would James Dyson solve it? How would Richard Branson solve it? How would Donald Trump no, 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 never mind Donald Trump. You know, you know, think of people you admire. Who do you think would solve this really well? Imagine you're them. Ask yourself, how would they solve it? How would they do it? And you'll find that you come up with great ideas because if they're good at doing this, you're able to think like them. So think like an actor. Go into that role and imagine what they would do. It's a great way of coming up uh, with, with really interesting solutions. Another thing is to understand adapting something. So look to another field. I, I love the area of biomimicry. Biomimicry is when you look at things that have happened in nature that millions and billions of years of evolution have led to these solutions in nature. How can you take those and adapt them for the problem that you've got? So you know, everything from sonar in the, in the, in the noses of dolphins to uh, the mating rituals of Patagonian sparrows. You know, you, you, you can find so many different things in nature that you can then adapt and apply to problems. One of the things that I like to do when I'm doing exercises with companies and we're looking at uh, how, to, how to innovate or how to, um, how to look at a process and change it is I use these little things called artifact cards. Wonderful, you should look them up on the internet, artifact cards. Now, on one side, the colored side, I get people to write down all of the assumptions. What are the things that you just assume you have to do here? So you write down all the assumptions on the colored side, and then you do another exercise where you say, right, take, take the cards, and now write the opposite of that assumption on the other side. So if the assumption is that this is, um, this is advertising we have to do, you know, that's the answer to this brief is advertising. Then on the other side, you say, that uh, you're not allowed to use advertising. So, so you, you change, you put the opposite on there, and then you put all the cards out, and you start to turn some of them over.
and see how it affects the way you, do with, you deal with a problem. And one of the things that you'll very often find is because there's very slow changes in business, that a lot of assumptions are completely out of date. And this helps to show you which assumptions are out of date, which ones you can play with, and that then helps you focus on where your innovation and your problem solving should be. And this is quite good. If you're expected to come up with a really great solution, you kind of have this pressure on yourself. And you think that you have to solve it. Your first idea has to solve it. No. Very often, you have to come up with lots of ideas. You have to explore lots of different territories. And it's good just to get the ideas moving. Because if you're expecting to come up with something great first time, you're putting a barrier on yourself that is impossible to get over. So give yourself 10 minutes to come up with the shittest ideas you can. Deliberately come up with dreadful ideas. And it starts to get the ideas flowing. And you'll actually find that some of those ideas you come up with, you may be able to come up with a dreadful idea, but you'll come up with something that's actually quite good. So it starts to get the ideas flowing, and you can start to raise your standards ever so slightly. But very often, the best ideas come from ridiculous jokes that you may have made yourself. I often find that um, a good sort of knob gag is a, a good way of actually leading to a great idea. If you come up with something that you're just making a joke with the brief, and you're being a bit rude about it, a bit facetious, then you very often come up with things. If it, if it, if it makes you laugh, it puts the hairs up in the back of your neck. There's probably something in it. And the ancient Greeks believed that wit was the highest form of intelligence. So you've got to enjoy yourself and, and actually deal with things a little bit like jokes. Because jokes are this... Sort of, if you think about the structure of a joke, like one of my favorite jokes is, what's brown and sticky? A stick. So what it does, if you think about it, it takes you here. Here you've got an assumption. What's brown and sticky? You think that sticky means something that's a bit sort of gooey. It takes you to there, and that's the direction that you're going in. But actually, the solution is here. You know, it gives you something that's unexpected, something that's a bit different. So if you think of the brief in that way, when you're trying to solve a problem, and you're thinking it with wit, and you're enjoying yourself, that's really important that you enjoy yourself. You don't come up with good ideas when you're annoyed. You have to enjoy it. Um, then you will come up with better ideas. Right. That is me done with the 12 points. And I guarantee if you use them that you will come up with better ideas. Um, now, this event is partly sponsored by Dot .me, isn't it? So where, where's the Dot .me folk? There we go, Natasha. Um, I thought that I would build a little site for you using the .me domain. So I, I created, let's see if this works. I created something for you which works on all your devices. It's called thissiteinspires.me. And if you go along here, I have given you 50 pieces of advice that if you're trying to solve a problem, whether it's a business problem, whether it's a communications problem, whatever kind of problem it is, we have taken, I've run workshops where I have got people to tell me what is good about things that are award-winning advertising, award-winning product design, award-winning businesses. I've got people to tell me what they can learn from it, all the good principles. We've got 50 of these principles on there. And all you do is you go along to the site, and you tr look at one of the principles, and you spend five minutes trying to apply that to your problem. Then you tap it again, and it gives you a new principle, and spend five minutes on that. So I'm hoping that that will help some of you. When you get stuck, please go along to this site inspires me. Um, and at that point, I would like to say thank you very much, and I think uh, Vladimir is going to come back on stage. has also some other freebies but before we start because we're a bit short on time I want to see the hands so whoever want to post a question just raise your hand and then they will explain <laughs> what kind of freebies he has for you okay <laughs> you're up so if, uh, if anyone's got any questions then everyone who answers a question correctly 
Uh, you, well, no, asks a question correctly. I'll do the answering, and I'll probably answer wrong. But if you ask a question correctly, you'll get a copy of the magazine. So um, that's, that's a little incentive. And it's the most badass magazine in the known universe, right? Oh, this magazine is amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the great things you'll find. And it has it? nude photos of Dave in it. So. <laughs> if you use your imagination, it's all, it's all in there. <laughs> it's great. If you find a wobbly table in a cafe, if it's really wobbly, you fold it like that and then put it under. Really. Okay, so one short question and the answer doesn't be, have to be that short. <laughs> if, if we took Don, Don Draper from Mad Men, put him in cryogen chamber, froze him up and woke him today, put him on this stage today, would he feel that anything has changed since the time we froze him in cryogen? Massively. You know, when I started in the advertising industry, I, I started in the, around about 91. And if you think about what life was like in 1991, which is 20 years after we left Don Draper at the end of Mad Men. In 1991, the advertising industry had, um, you had posters, you had television, you had radio, you had direct mail. They're kind of done. Now we have, with the internet, we have a pixelated reflection of every single one of these. And we have so much more. And I, I think that there's, there, there's a common mistake that um, you'll very often find with digital advertising, and you'll find with any form of advertising, the biggest mistake that anyone makes in advertising. Are you ready for this? The biggest mistake is to think that your audience gives a shit. Because they don't. And it's the same, business makes this mistake, advertising makes this mistake, and I think it's the most common mistake in business. And um, it's the same for digital as it is for analog anything. You've just got to care about people. We have a first question okay, here. Thank you. Uh, so work, you know. <laughs> uh, before you launch an idea to the market, and um, uh, if we, uh, yeah, as clients, ex expect it to be a success, how would you know that this idea will be successful well, by not be subjective? Okay, I would say that the, the worst thing you can do is put it through research. Um, research, um, what it does, if you, you imagine um, sort of you, you've been asked to, to do, go and do some advertising research or research on a product or whatever, you, um, oh yes, you get a magazine. Um, <laughs> you get a bunch of people in a room, you feed them some shitty wine, you give them some cheap biscuits and some crisps, and you say to them, these people who've got no understanding of advertising or of business product or whatever, you ask these people, what do you think? And you know the worst thing the worst thing that happens when you ask people their opinion is they give it to you. Um, and they just make it up. And they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. And what happens is that what makes an idea interesting is what we call spikiness. It's stuff that maybe jars with you a bit, stuff that's a little bit unusual. If you put things through research, it removes all the spikiness until you've got this cup of lukewarm vomit. It, it, it just is nothing. It is, so, I'd say that research is the worst thing to do before you launch an idea. Um, what I recommend that people do is the whole um, entrepreneurial thing of release early and iterate often according to, how, um, according to how people use the product or your communication campaign or whatever. And I think that's something that the advertising industry needs to do is needs to start developing maybe four or five little ideas put some of your investment into that, so you've got to think of your advertising budget as an investment, not as paying for this campaign, it's an investment. So you put, you put it in to put a few ideas out to market, you see what people respond to, and you use the rest of your budget developing that as people respond to it. Now, I'm not seeing agencies do this, and there's a lot of businesses think that we understand the consumer and they are going to act like this, therefore we're going to create this product. I think that is a terrible, egotistical problem to imagine that your consumer, your audience, that you know them well enough to know exactly how they're going to respond. Because you don't and you never can. Question there? Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, recently, recently, my boss uh, wanted to, to have a viral online campaign. Did, did you punch him? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> listen, to, listen to this. Do, do, you want, do you want me to punch him? <laughs> 
he put us in the office, office, and we had a brainstorming session. Is there a bucket for me to be sick in? And, <laughs> and the, the, the happy part of the thing is that he's my ex-boss now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the question is, what, uh, what is your experience with creating viral campaigns? Well, well the, uh, apart from vomiting. Apart from yeah. vomiting. Um, I've, got, I've got to admit that I was actually, I'm one of the people to blame for that. I did a lot of um, what they call viral stuff in the early 2000s. Um, I did the, the, the biggest viral of 2006, and I got loads of advertising awards for this. Now, the problem is that people use the word viral as if it's a noun thinking that a viral is a thing, we are going to create a viral. Viral is not a noun, it's an adjective. It's how you describe something. We created a video and it went viral. Okay, so you cannot create a viral. You can create something that you hope will go viral. So this is a problem when people talk about viral, that they think it's a thing. You can only create something that you hope will resonate with an audience. And the way to do that is you've got to find a group of passionate people. If you've got the whole, I said the biggest mistake that people make is that they think their audience gives a shit. You've actually got to find people who do. And if you find a, a people who are passionate, who are part of your audience, who are passionate, you can activate them and, these, and, and get them to do things, whether that's sharing your video or, or whatever. Um, but if you are hoping to just speak to everyone, the problem is that you speak to no one. So you've actually got to be really focused on a, a very small uh, audience. And that niche audience are the ones who are going to help this thing grow. So there's a few tactics. And you also need to, you also need to seed things. So there is kind of this myth that if you build it, they will come. That if you create something that is just a brilliant piece of viral something and you put it up online, that immediately the internet will be drawn to it like, like flies to a turd. <laughs> But most people don't know it's there. So you need a seeding strategy to get your idea out to the right places. And that costs you money. You basically have to pay to get it promoted by sites. One last question. Sorry, Vlad, and sorry, Vera. Just one last one. Hi. First of all, great talk. Thank you. <laughs> so inspiring. Um, how do you advertise with no money? Um, well, You've got to get yourself out of a job. <laughs> do you know, I've got to say that the, one of the hardest things I've had to do, that I think I've, I've, it was a, a few years ago, I was, uh, I was asked to do a television campaign in Russia. It was just to do a 60-second piece of film um, for this, uh, this TV ad. And I asked, right, what's the thing we've got to advertise? I get, I get the brief. It was pretty good. And now, what's, uh, what's our budget? Because I basically had an overnight to write a script. The budget was $2 million to do a 60-second piece of film in Russia. Now, at that point, I'm solving the wrong problem. I'm solving the problem of how do I spend $2 million, not how do I do the best idea. Um, so having no budget or little budget can very often help you. Um, one of the ways to do it is to think, instead of thinking advertising, you think PR, and you just ask yourself the question, what can I do that the news will report on? What can I do that people on chat shows will want to talk about? And if you think in that way, you'll be able to come up with solutions that require very little or even no budget at all and get a high impact. Thanks. You can get the copy of the magazine, a free copy of the magazine at Menet Boot. So just visit the Menet Boot and there's a free copy of the ma magazine. So. Uh, one last thing, Dave forgot, when he was mentioning the sources of creativity, he forgot to mention one untapped source of creativity, and that's chocolate. So give it up for chocolate and Dave. <laughs> Thank you very much.